Uh, I wanted to start a new series that uh, God has been kind of speaking to my heart about this series for a little while. Uh, one that I'm guessing uh, about six weeks and probably is something we can revisit again uh, as we move forward as a church. Uh, but the reality is, you know, what we can share, uh, the premise to this whole series is, is a phrase that, that I say sometimes, and it's that I think sometimes music can make us the greatest liars. Sometimes I think music can make us the greatest. I also want to read some that I came up with. Several songs that, that are examples of this. We drive down the road, we sing words, and they don't mean anything. We say we're riding through the desert on a horse with no name. We cry out that we're the champions till the end, we'll keep on fighting. We say, New York, New York, and our Frank Sinatra. And we've never been any further than New York, Nebraska. <laughs> say that. We sing songs that say, Bye bye, Miss American Pie. Drove my Chevy to the levee, but the levee was dry as we're driving our Toyota Prius down the highway. I'm telling you, music can make us some of the greatest liars. I mean, uh, what is Strawberry Fields Forever anyway? We don't know, but we sing it from the bottom of our heart. We build it as loud as, as we can. And the concern sometimes I feel what translates in the church is what happens as we're driving our car. Some music can make us some of the greatest liars. And we're singing because we like the melody, we like the song, we like the way it sounds. We're not really that worried. I mean, seriously, my wife makes fun of me all the time because whenever I sing a song and she's around, I'm making up words because I don't even know what the words are. I just make them up. That's not what it says. Yeah, it is. And she proves me wrong every time. It's not about the words, it's about the music. You know, we spend time every Sunday. We had an opportunity to share about Sunday school this morning. It was our first Sunday back, and, and Walt was talking about that at the beginning of service. But why do we do Sunday school? What's the value that comes from that? As, we, as we're, as we're re-entering things, you know, why do we spend time on Sundays singing? And if it's just about singing, then go sit in the parking lot and sing at the top of your lungs. If it's just about the music, then there's lots of songs that you can sing. But the reality is, is that we made some pretty profound declarations with our lips this morning. Amen. Whether you realize it or not, you said some pretty remarkable things as you were singing songs and you were reading the words and saying those words or singing along with the worship team today. And I don't want the church to be like your car. My heart as a pastor is that music isn't making us great liars, but expressing truly what we believe on the inside. Amen. That when we say these words, we're not just singing with the tune, but it becomes an encounter where we're expressing something inwardly to God Himself. I'm going to pray because over the next few weeks, I want to take, what I want to do is each week just take a song. Some that we sing and some that we haven't sang before, but just look at it. Look at them closer. And I just want to stop and think about what we sang. I want to stop and think about what the words were singing and maybe give a little bit of bones or flesh to those bones and, and, and help us picture these these words in a, in, in a different way that just become words on a screen or, or a song that, that Walt sings, and, that maybe we can see some of the implications biblically behind what we're seeing. It helps us in that moment to express our hearts fully. I'm going to pray, Father, I thank you for what you're doing. And I thank you for your word, and I thank you for the opportunity to look at your word today. Thank you for this series, God. There's an excitement in my heart.
for this time, where we get to spend time looking at the profession of all of our lips, words that we've, we've said, God. And I pray that as we, as we dig in, God, there's connections, there's heart connections, there's mind connections, there's spirit connections that happen, God, to these songs. So that Sunday is not just some more singing, but it's an experience with our King. God, I pray your anointing upon these words. I ask that you would guide and direct everything that is said. As we dig into the Word, that you would help us to see and understand, to hear and know in Jesus' name. Amen. I will say, typically I have no communication with Walt during the week about what songs to sing. These few weeks, I will let Walt know one song that he needs to sing. So it kind of goes along. So there is some communication that has happened with Walt and I this week. But I want to go back to the last song that we sang. And I want to just spend a moment and, and read the words again. So that, that they said, Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Free at last. He's ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father's house, but there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I'm chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. And you know, when I look at these words, there's a, there's a phrase in there that kind of stood out to me because it resonated with my understanding of the Scripture. There was a phrase in there that, 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 that really kind of stood, stood out to me. And it's right here. It said, who the sun sets free, oh, is, is free indeed. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. Maybe I've heard that somewhere before. And so, so in your Bibles, if you turn to John uh, chapter 8. Verse 31 says, to the Jews who have believed in Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then verse 22, it says, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you jump down to verse 36, because there's still some encounter that's happening there, but verse 36 literally reads, so if the Son sets you free, I mean, look, it, it reads as a song, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Well, there it is. So, I mean, I'm real smart. If I'm saying this, maybe there was some context to this that I need to comprehend. Maybe I need to look at this portion of Scripture and see what God is speaking in this chapter. And maybe it will help me to fully understand this whole idea of who you say I am. So that was in, in verse 31 and, and 36. And so I just went to the beginning of that chapter. I, I began to look at what was happening in the beginning. And, you know, I'll read this story and I'll talk about myself. But Jesus, he went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around and he sat down the teacher of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in an altar. And they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, the, in the law Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? Verse 6 says they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus, he bent down and he started to write on the ground with his finger kept questioning him, he straightened up and said, let any one who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The old ones first until only Jesus was left 
with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and lead your life of sin. The song that we're looking at, it says, Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? Who am I that, 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 that would be ransomed, or that the ransom would be paid for me? Who am I that, that I would be free, you know, the one the sun sets free, is free? We seem to be dealing with a song that is all about identity, like who am I? And I think this chapter starts with a woman who we're seeing truly in an identity crisis. It's a critical moment in her life. What's happening? Jesus is coming. He's in the temple courts. And the scripture says very clearly, all the people were there. So there was a pretty big crowd of all the people were there. Apart from this moment, there's this woman. And what has she done? She has been caught in adultery. So she's done wrong. I don't think there's any question to the reality of her sin. She was caught in adultery. Independent of this moment with Jesus, they're bringing this woman before the Pharisee because she's been caught doing the wrong thing. So her actions have started the identification, right? Who is she? Well, they said she's an adulterer. That's what they told her, right? She's an adulterer. The Pharisees then, they heard who she was. So her actions began to define her. Her actions began to communicate who she was. Her title was adulterer. So then what did the Pharisees do? I mean, seriously. They bring her before the entire crowd. Come on. If her action wasn't enough to identify her, all the crowd is plenty. So now she's got, I don't know how many eyes looking at her as they begin to say who she is. This woman, the Pharisees say, is an adulterer. That's who she is. She's been defined by her actions, but now she's been defined by everyone else. I mean, how do you escape that moment? Can you imagine? I mean, do one thing if they say, hey, Jesus, come over here. We want to put this perplexing thing before you and trap the way of the crowd. But really, she was just a tool for them to trap, to trap Jesus. That's what Scripture tells us. <coughs> so they put her before the crowd, and then they begin to speak who she is. She's an adulterer. So now she's been defined by her actions, and she's been defined by others in what they see and know about her, and what they've heard about her. And what do they say? They want to trap Jesus, so they bring up the law. The law's already identified someone in her position. The law's already written the story for someone in that moment. And they said, Jesus, you know the law, and you know what the law of Moses says. And that law says that anyone who is caught in this act needs to be what? They're stuck. They're condemned to die. been defined by her actions. Her fault. Her problem. She's been defined by others. And now she's been defined by law. Who is she? She's an adulterer. She's screwed up. He's probably embarrassed and ashamed. He's absolutely condemned to die. I mean, how does she feel anything other than that through the first part of the story? That's, that's, that's the reality of who I am. I mean, it has to be trapped by, by, by what's been defined. And, and what does Jesus do? What does Jesus do? The scripture says, and there's a lot to think about what this is, and, and I really wish I knew more, but that he bent down as they're talking to him and trying to trap him, and he begins to write in the sand with his fingers. One theory that I read, which I really liked, was he began to write sins in the sand. And they kept pushing him. They just kept writing more sins in the sand. What happened? They were trying to trap him with what? The law. But Jesus spoke the truth to them. 
He spoke to them and he said, yeah, that might be what the law says, but I, I tell you what, let the one of you, whoever among you has not sinned. And I'm guessing that if he wrote in the sand, Jesus is pointing in the sand right now. Maybe not. That's, that's again, please interpret this to the lens of Pastor Steve right now. And there's a lot of old lies going on. And a lot of people pointing at each other. Because it's not mine. That's it. And Jesus is saying, hey, what of the one of you who has not sinned? Go ahead and cast the first stone. We're not breaking the law. He's fulfilling the law. He said, okay, let's fulfill it. The first one of you who has not committed any sin, go ahead and, and, and cast the first stone. So what do I see as the pastors are looking at that? Jesus is beginning to redefine, re-identify her. And he's erasing the law. So you can identify who we say you are is condemned to take rocks to your face until you die. That's who you are. And Jesus is saying, hang on. Let's just, let's just change that. And then you've been identified by all these eyes. The eyes of all the people that are gathered there looking at you. All the ones that are in the middle of this moment staring at you. The ones that are making accusations and the ones that are hearing this for the very first time. The ones who are beginning to, to look for their rocks, you know, like finding that one with just that sharp one that's really going to make an impact. You've been identified by them. Mike's back there. I can't see him right now. Or Greg. I guess I talked to Greg with this quite a bit. You've been branded. You know what I mean? How can she not be branded? That mark is upon her. That scarlet letter is on her for this crowd, for all those people. That's who she is. At this, it's at verse 9. Those who had heard, or those who heard, began to go away one at a time. Until only Jesus was left. I want you to think about that moment. All those eyes that stared at her, all those ones that accused her, all the ones who knew exactly what she had done, they were removed from the moment. I see Jesus. What I see happening in the Word of God is, is yeah, you were defined by the law, but I've spoken to that. Now you've been defined by men, and I'm speaking to that. They're all leaving. And all that's left is her and Jesus. I want you to think about that moment. Because the reality of Jesus' instructions to the people was what? Let the one without sin cast the first stone. So what it tells me is that if we're just looking for one without sin to cast the first stone, once Jesus got this party started, everything was going to happen. We were just waiting for one without sin to throw that stone. Jesus was the only one in that entire crowd that could condemn her to die. Jesus was the only one in that entire crowd that could bring her to death. And she's left standing alone with him. I'm guessing... She knows who Jesus is. I'm guessing she recognizes he's the one that all the people gather to talk, to listen to, to learn from. And she's still identified by one thing. And what is that? It's herself. There's still one thing that hasn't been addressed. She's left alone with herself and Jesus. He's removed the law. He's removed the crowds. He's removed the names and the accusations. But she's left standing before him. And what does he say? Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? There's 
no one in Pooter. Does no one include this woman? He said, you've been defined by the wall, and you've been defined by others, but now let's look at you. I, I don't see any room in Scripture that says she wasn't in adultery. I don't see her fighting or arguing when they say the law says to stone her. She's accepted who she was. But Jesus said, has anyone, has no one, is, is there anyone left? Because no one's left to condemn you, correct? And she says, no one, sir. So what does he say to her? And neither do I condemn you. Go and lead your life of sin. He's taking care of the wall. He's taking care of the crowds. And now he's dealing with the crowds. How many know sometimes we can deal with the wall and we can deal with the crowds, but it's really hard when it's just me and Jesus? And Jesus is looking at her and he's saying, Who truly has condemned you? And the proclamation of her mouth is that no one has condemned her. So that means that I'm not condemning myself either. So what does Jesus say? If you're not condemning yourself, then go and be transformed. Go and lead the life of sin that puts you in this moment. And then your identity becomes something completely different than these last 15 or 20 minutes or hour and a half. But a son belongs to it forever. 
in the one who is a son, who is a child of God. That song says, I am a child of God. What does that mean? I'm no longer defined by my sin. I'm no longer defined by the accusations. I'm no longer defined by the punishment for my sin. But I'm defined because I've accepted who I am in Jesus Christ. My place in the kingdom of God. My position in his family. And because of what Jesus Christ did, Scripture said we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But the gift of God is eternal life that comes through Jesus Christ. I have a place in his family. I can declare that I'm a child of God if I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. If I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I will be saved. I am made a child of God. Who? Who are you? I just said to sing this chorus again. And I want to conclude the service today. Right where we're at the service, the worship service then. Because I want us to think about the words of this song. And I don't know what, what's been identifying you in your life this day, this week, this month. If you've been identified by anything other than who you are in Him, I want you to come to a moment where you're standing basically just with you and Jesus, where He can start to take those lies, those accusations, those condemnations, and usher them out of your life. You know, you might say this morning that, that I'm just a I'm just a sinner. I screwed up again. And again. And again. But the promise that God has for you today is that you're not, you're not defined by your sins. You know, there might be some who say, man, but Everyone tells me this is who I am. Everyone says it. I heard it over and over again. I'm not going to amount to anything. Or I'm going to be everything. They, they told me that. And you allow them to define you. But you know the moment Jesus Christ. The moment where it's only you and him. The moment where the Father's love is demonstrated in the Son. You know, sometimes that when we condemn ourselves, we say, I'm just destined to fail. I know me. I know my track record. I know who wrote the picture of the Bible. It's failure tomorrow.
morning before you said these words because I don't want you to make a lie out of anyone. And you don't know what it means to be a child of God or you're struggling with some of these defilers in your life. I want an opportunity to shepherd your heart. I want a moment to spread with you so we can talk about what it means to be a child of God, what it means to be set free, what it means to be free from the curse of sin and death. If you want that moment, I'm going to make myself available. I'll be in that front pew. You can come over, we can talk, we can pray. These words can be an expression of your heart. That word is not made for a liar, but a worshiper in these next few words. That words not deceive you, but words empower you to express who you are in Him. Amen?